I go. Okay, it is 6.15. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, Mr. Yates, can I have a roll call, please? Mrs. Eichholz? Here. Dr. Hooker? Here. Mrs. Johnston? Here. Mrs. Lewis? Here. Mrs. Singh? Here. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to adopt the regular meeting agenda and addendum? And so moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Let's well, push the button, don't you? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it works on the button anymore. Let me try well, this one over here. Let me text Denny. Maybe he can make that work. We have no lights. Can you come fix it? Uh, so in the meantime, hey, Ken? Ken? Hey, Ken? Can you hear me? Nope. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Melissa. We got him turned on, Melissa. Melissa to the rescue. Um, can I have a motion to go into executive session? Um, in accordance with Ohio Revised Code 121.2.2, Section 2, Section 2, Section 2, Section 2, Section 2, Section 2, to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee or floor official. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Call, please. Mrs. Johnston? Aye. Mrs. Singh? Aye. Dr. Hooker? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mrs. Eichholz? Aye. Hang on one second. Okay, it is 7.02 and we're going to reconvene the um, regular meeting and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, Mr. Connecticut, would you like to start with correspondence, recognition, and announcements? Yes, welcome everybody, and uh, we've got a couple of uh, important announcements. I'd like to start tonight by talking about our school reopening update, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we fielded several inquiries about the reopening of our schools, and I wanted to share several updates. Um, there are several important items that pertain to COVID-19 that have been influencing the state's delays in communications about reopening schools. And I think our board and our administration understand how frustrating that is and how stressful it can be for families. We want to try to minimize disruptions for them. But I want to share a couple important points tonight. Uh, first, there's been much discussion in the last few days that the Ohio Department of Health is considering the development of an alert system for schools. Um, that planning will be shared with us soon, but it has not been unveiled yet. So we are awaiting that news. Uh, second, there's recent legislation that's been proposed in the Ohio Senate that is being weighed in Columbus currently uh, with regards to local control for school opening decision making for boards of education. And the impact of the timings of those hearings and testimony are also causing a delay in us getting school news. Third, um, a lot of our parents saw news last week um, about some school items that were issued in Warren County. And I just want to clarify to everybody that we are required to follow guidance from Hamilton County, not Warren County. And we are in constant contact with our county health officials who have been very helpful throughout the entire pandemic process to update us just as soon as they get new guidance from the state of Ohio. We don't have any more or less information than any other school in our county at this time. And um, I feel like that communication that went out late last week caused some confusion in our general area around Cincinnati because it came from another county. Um, but those are not the officials that we are beholden to and work with. Here's some good news. Um, House Bill 164 was passed into law last Friday. Uh, those who have seen it know that it gives us some similar flexibility moving forward as a school district to manage COVID-19 related operations in the 2020-2021 school year, much like the previous resolutions that were passed during the pandemic that you all passed a resolution on that allowed us to manage and operate the district with much more flexibility. This is really good news for the class of 2021 and for all students with regards to testing um, specifically. So we'll be sharing some information about that, but it allows us to operate in a more flexible manner. Um, today, we'll be releasing an update for parents with results from our May 21st parent survey. We left that parent survey open for more than two and a half weeks 
I think it's still open actually. Uh, we received over 985 responses. It's the greatest survey I've ever seen for 1,400 families in a school district. I was really happy with the input that we received from parents. Our administration and our teachers that are working in committees to plan for the fall are very thankful for that input. And we understand that a majority of our parents wish for a safe return to their students to come to campus in the fall and do in-person learning. We know that that's what they all want. And of course, I think we would welcome that if, if we're given the opportunity to do it that way. We are currently preparing three scenarios for school models for the fall that we have shared in general. We have staff committees working on them. One model is a return to campus for interested families to the extent that is allowable under the law. Um, another model will also allow us to offer a full online option to families that are interested, which we have heard from families who have an interest in that. And developing that type of program is important to us. And we also know that our staff uh, has been training and intends to be fully trained and prepared to pivot to a hybrid or blended learning model if it's necessary or if it's required moving forward. So our staff has worked very hard. I commend Dr. Stewart and the committees and our administrative team for all the work they put into these three models. Um, we hope to be able to give people much more detail as soon as we release, uh, release that update with some guidance from ODH. Uh, and we'll also get some uh, suggestions from the Ohio Department of Education we'll have to take into account. But our county health officials are really driving what we can and can't do in terms of safety right now, and we are waiting on some news from them. Can I just ask a question in the interest of transparency so the community knows what we're thinking about? I see one of the biggest hurdles, and I'm hearing this from other school districts, is going to be the busing. If you come back fully on, you know, in here, how do you get the kids here? And I just think that we need to know that the, the community needs to know that you all are actively looking at all the potential options, everything from canceling high school busing to a free up buses for the elementary and primary and middle. But also one thing that I think we ought to consider that you may have already thought about but we should look at is if we're going to try to bring every kid to school every day, doing it in shifts isn't going to work. That's going to fall apart massively. I think that our, we have a very tight-knit community that I think, based on that survey, 40% of people said they're planning on bringing their own kid to school. If we could get a percentage of the district to agree to bring their kid to school every day, then we only have to bust the rest of the percentage, but plan for it. In other words, say, you know, we're not forcing you, we're not refusing to bust your fourth grader, but if you are willing to commit to bringing your kid to school and picking them up every day, you know, that brings up another set of nightmares. I get it, a lot of cars, but I think that we could potentially be able to do this. There is no way we can go buy 20 extra buses, or at least 20 extra buses. But I think it would be a disservice to the community. And I've heard, and I think Nikki's heard, and other people have heard, everybody says, please do not bring us half day this and half day that, or kids coming in, some kids get here at eight, some kids get here at nine. It's just not gonna work. So yeah, I would I like us to actively look at the potential of involving our parents in the solution of transport. Yes, and I, I think to your point, when parents see our update, uh, Dr. Hooker, what they will see is a summary of some of their input, and they have um, signaled to us that there could be some flexibility in terms of transportation, as well as food service delivery options that will allow us to plan more effectively. Um, and we also know that they signaled that we have a segment who have needs that we're going to make sure that we, we cover. Um, and so when the parents receive that update here um, later, I hope that they will continue to review all of that and give us input along the way. We're also including in our updates some next steps, and part of those next steps will be a much more specific survey to a parent where they will give individual selection and choice feedback about their children, and also we're going to give them an opportunity for some further input as we plan and move forward. So I hope that um, that clears up some of the things that, that we're working on and it gives people a general update. But I will share with all of you, um, I, we are frustrated professionally and waiting for the news. We understand that our parents also want to know, and we know that they want to be here. And I believe on campus is the best for our students. Uh, we'll do whatever we can that's allowable under the law and that's safe to bring them back. And, and we hope to hear her soon. Yeah, I, I, I have a question because I read in the news uh, the last few days that Cincinnati Public has come out with um, like five different plans and um, 
they're obviously waiting on what the health department's going to say as well, but some of them depend on can we, can we socially distance six feet versus socially distance three feet. So I guess my question in, in putting together the plan for everybody to come back, is that assuming that we can actually six feet socially distance? Yes, right now the plans that our staff are working on are following the guardrails we've been given, and to date they are six feet of social distancing on all sides, masks required, and we are being told that bus capacity is an issue that's being discussed. So when we get those guardrails more well defined, we'll know what our classroom capacity or, or a learning space size could could work, how, how many students we could work with. We'll also know how many we can transport and um, we're, we're hoping for as much flexibility as possible in making those decisions. Kim, I think one thing that if I understood the CDC's recommendation, and please, Melissa, somebody correct me, they're saying you don't have to be six feet apart front to back as long as it's front to back. In other words, you gotta be six feet side to side. Am I right on that, guys? Well, I think this is a great, a great point that you're making again, Dr. Hooker, and this is what caused some confusion with the news last week from another county. The state has to tell us whether the county decides or whether the Ohio Department of Health will give everyone the same guidance. And right now in Hamilton County, it's six feet on all sides. Okay. So until Hamilton County gives us different guidance or ODH overrules that, that's what we have to go by. Okay. And so, sorry, what I was interested in is, it sounds to me like you're gonna give the option if parents really don't wanna bring their kids back, they could do online learning. Is that yes. Right? And how will you um, level the playing field so that the level of education experience is the same for them across the board? Uh, I would just say uh, right now, uh, Elizabeth, that we are looking at providing our high quality teachers and our faculty to deliver that programming. And Dr. Stewart and the faculty have been working to do professional development with some of the best blended learning experts in the country, uh, one of whom is local to the University of Cincinnati, another is the University of Colorado. Uh, I am very pleased with the professional learning plan that we put in place. Our teachers have committed to an additional 30 hours of learning this summer, whether they end up being the online teacher or not, to be ready for hybrid learning. And I believe that those teachers that we uh, either allocate or assign to those roles based on the demand for how many students we need to service it is, is going to be fine and they're going to be our teachers and they're going to be prepared. And one other question, if let's say 100% of our students come back to be on campus, can our room sizes accommodate all of them at the same time? We can, we can accommodate everybody if we're allowed to bring them all back, um, and that'll depend on the guidance. And I, I believe that there is going to be a social distancing requirement. We're just not sure exactly what it's going to be just yet. Nobody has told us that there won't be social distancing expected or required, and we're really waiting to get that detail. And how are you going to police that social distancing? And uh, Maybe that's not the right term. I'm sorry. Um, but of course. We're gonna, but you understand, yeah. it's one thing to say that you that you can expect six feet social distancing, but how do you enforce that? What I would equate this with right now is not enforcement so much as learning and education. It's going to be a come a part of our program, um, just as we. Uh, show young students how to maneuver the hallways in our primary building, we're going to teach them about social distancing. We're going to teach people the difference between a rationale for wearing a mask or having a shield on. Uh, we're going to have to talk to our students and train them and teach them, as well as adults. Um, it's going to become a part of our learning and, our, and how we manage our culture together. And a lot of it's going to be an honor system. And, and then we're going to learn from mistakes as we go. And I don't think it's a perfect system, which is another reason why many people want more details and more guidance than less. So I think we're going to work through it together and we're going to do a lot of learning together. And people ultimately have to feel safe and confident when they come to school. Thank you. And Kurt, so, um, I assume, again, we don't know what they're going to say, but I'm assuming that the current tea leaves are saying that it's going to require a mask. I don't want to um, guess. Okay. Uh, because I think that's what everybody is trying to do. What we have been told to date 
the current guidance from our county is that social distancing is required, masks are required, and that there will be limited capacity for learning spaces and buses that are being considered. We've been told to expect those things. That could change tomorrow, but that's what we've been told, so that's how we're trying to move forward with our planning. Okay, thank you. Okay, so just, just to clarify. So right now, we're waiting for the state government or the governor or the Senate, whoever's in the process of deciding, to tell ODH what jurisdiction they have, and then they determine if it's by county or by state. Is that the what I'm understanding? My understanding is that the executive branch and the Ohio Health Department will tell us what the general guidance is okay. and that they intend to give each county authority to make local decisions about that guidance. Okay. So the question re remains, will there be some blanket statements by the Ohio Department of Health for all 610 school districts in Ohio or not? We don't know yet. Okay. And what is turned over in terms of authority to Hamilton County, we must follow and it might look different than another county. I'll just follow up by saying um, Hamilton County, Franklin County, and Cuyahoga County have been planning very closely and aligned because they are the largest population centers in the state and there are the largest amount of health concerns in those counties. So that is another thing that may make decision making for Hamilton County a little different than another county. Um, and when the governor signals what level gets to make the most decisions, we will know. How about the music department and the theater? Will they also be coming back? and will, Or will that all be online? Because there was a talk uh, that uh, music classes will be all online. Is that right? Or uh, no, I don't, I don't think any plans are set in stone. Okay. I think all of our options are to try to maximize the amount of programs and okay. courses we offer. I think that our teachers went into the planning with our administrators to try to continue to offer those things we believe make us uniquely Indian Hill in terms of course offerings and to hold as many of them intact as possible. And some of that will be based on what we learn. Okay. We, we hope to offer uh, what we, all that we can offer. All that we can offer, that's good. So is there a timeline when we will know that when, uh, no. by when we will? I, 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 we had hoped that the timeline would be, uh, we would be getting an update today. We have not, and it has been delayed for over two weeks, and, and we understand that that's frustrating, but as soon as we know, um, we everyone in the county will know, we will get that guidance at the same time, and we will share out as soon as we get that. What about the date for opening school? Is that up in the air as well? Right now, our current school calendar is intact. We have not moved forward with communicating the official first day of school because, again, we do not know what the guidance is, and we may want to revisit and dialogue about our school calendar based on what we learn. Thank you. Thank you. I wish we could give you more detail and everybody <laughs> listening, and I understand, and I appreciate you asking all those questions, and, and hopefully our parents understand. We're going to share with them an update here um, uh, tonight, and um, then we'll also move forward as soon as we get more detail. I guess the only question that I would have for you, for you as a follow-up given our um, board meeting dates is that our next regularly scheduled meeting is beginning of August. And if the legislation passes that the, the school boards on an individual basis must set what the guidance is for their schools, then we are going to have to have a, because we cannot, you, as, administra as administrators, you can't just start assuming that that's the way we're going to the board would have to vote on it and discuss it and make decisions. So I only say that because we don't have any regularly scheduled board meetings for July, and we probably need to think about um, having availability and doing it obviously sooner rather than later so that we can, we can tell. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. As soon as we know more, then we can talk about a schedule. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, as soon as do it, you know, do something like a doodle poll or something to figure out when everybody's available as soon as we can, can yeah. make a decision. Thank you. So a couple of other uh, celebration comments we'd like to make under the uh, recognition part of this. Uh, I want to congratulate Pranav for Stogie. Recently, Pranav's artwork on the pandemic was selected as part of the Congressional Art Competition. Uh, he received a second place overall prize in his category. 
and his piece of artwork is going to be displayed for the next year in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol Building. So congratulations to Pranav Rostogi uh, of the high school for his wonderful artwork. I also would like to congratulate outgoing senior Manny Antonucci, who was recently named the Small School Girls Basketball Player of the Year uh, for the second straight year, which is a wonderful accomplishment for her. And she's getting ready to move on to Florida Gulf Coast University to continue playing. Uh, so we're, we're really proud of Maddie and congratulations to her. Um, and I believe that next up is a report on our food service. Uh, what this is, it, I called it a food service report. Um, the United States Department of Agriculture requires that we uh, have this presentation for the board. Unfortunately, because of numbers, we're not allowed to bring our food service management team in. So I tried to improvise and do the best I could. I put what they were going, what they would present as their PowerPoint presentation. It goes over just basically what they're going to train their staff in each year. And then the date that they trained them for this year was August 11th, 2019. And then I also added three uh, supplement, supplementary documents um, that they would have talked about as well. Um, basically, uh, our, our main goal here is to satisfy that requirement that there was a presentation for the board. And even this minimal presentation will satisfy that requirement. Okay. Um, item C is an update on the energy project. Um, I asked uh, Mr. Brad Motes of Motes Engineering to prepare a summary. I will read that. Last fall, the school district advertised and invited energy service contractors to submit qualifications for a design build energy performance contract. Qualifications were received from nine companies. Five companies were interviewed, and for those interviews, four, from those interviews, four organizations were invited to submit formal proposals. The proposal process was delayed due to COVID-19. The formal proposals were received on June 12th and the two most responsive firms were interviewed on June 17th. Comp competitive pricing was provided for seven energy saving initiatives. Based upon their site visits, all the responders were encouraged to offer other saving ideas in the form of substitute bids. At least 25 substitute proposals were provided by the two firms that were interviewed. The school district and Motes Engineering are compiling a revised scope of work to integrate some of these additional energy saving concepts. The two finalists will then submit final pricing. It is envisioned that the revised information will be distributed to contractors by the beginning of next week and that the final pricing will be available near the middle of July. The energy saving project will likely range in cost from two and a half million to four million dollars with a target of an estimated payback based upon energy and operational savings of not more than 15 years. So again, that may be another reason why we need to have an, uh, a special meeting in July. We may have something along the lines of accepting a proposal from one of these uh, energy um, fitters. A lot of good information. They've, some of their, their supplemental proposals are really good. Like what, just out of curiosity? Uh, one of the best ones, um, I think Elizabeth mentioned it before, but one of them talked about ultraviolet lighting. I believe it's ultraviolet violet, um, that will help, they will go next to our filters and actually help uh, kill bacteria and germs as they before they even get to the filter. Um, that was one of the, I just remember reading that one briefly. Um, some of them talked about even putting on um, ways to save energy when we open up our freezers. Um, so it's actually saving, instead of having all of the cold come out of the freezer, right. we have the ability to keep that cold in there and it, it saves on energy. All these things that we don't think of all the time, um, a lot of great proposals. So yeah. um, we look forward to um, talking with the remaining two, two groups. Um, we're going to refine their proposals and we'll, we'll hopefully have something ready for the board in July and maybe we can even get something started in late July, early August before the kids come back. Sounds exciting. <clears throat> Would you like so, to move on to the superintendent's reports? So a board for your consideration tonight, we have several items uh, under A. Uh, number one is the approval of a new kindergarten teacher. I know Mrs. Graves wished she could be here this evening, but because of our restrictions to numbers, she's not here live. Um, but we have several uh, under number two, several third party salary payments uh, for reimbursements. 
under number three, there are approval of several supplemental, uh, supplemental contracts. Under number four, we are uh, looking for the approval of our new IHHS assistant principal, Mr. Andrew Renner. Under number five, we are asking for the approval of classified staff salary adjustments. Under number six, items A through J, as well as under the addendum, items K and L, we are asking for the approval of several supplemental contracts for uh, summer work. Mm -hmm. Under number seven, uh, approval of non-certified staff contracts and salaries. And under number eight, approval of administrative contract salary adjustment. And then we also have an additional um, piece under number nine, uh, items A through H. Those are uh, resignations and retirements. We also have under the addendum item I, which is the resignation of our current assistant superintendent, Dr. Mark Alt. Under number 10, uh, we have tuition reimbursements for several salary, for several, several staff members, sorry. Um, and after some discussion, I would ask that you would entertain uh, items A, one through 10, plus those addendum items for approval. Um, and I know we'd probably like to have some minor discussion about uh, item uh, 9I, Dr. Alt. So one, one thing I do, I want to comment, I want to go back to item um, number four, item A, the new assistant principal at the high school, which we're very excited about Drew Renner um, joining us. It's unfortunate that he can't be here with us tonight, but that's what it's going to be for a while, I think. Um, but I do want to point out that um, in the personnel committee, we did ask Dr. Ault if we had any minority um, applicants for this position, and we had none. And so I think, um, you know, going forward, my experience with diversity and inclusion is you have to be intentional, and I know that we are intentional, but I think you have to be really intentional. So I would hope that the next time there's a big position open, or any position for that matter, that we find ways to engage pools of minority applicants so that we are representing our school population, and um, and getting the best people out there at the same time. And, um, you know, we probably need to be more welcoming outwardly when we are interviewing people, uh, because if they don't feel that they're like us, they may not want to come and get to know us. So I would just hope we would continue that, because I know it's always on top of mind, but I think if we just all know to make it just that much more intentional, it would be great. Um, and then I just want to say, um, you know, how really sorry we are to see Dr. Alt leave. I'm excited for this uh, superintendent position for him. It rounds out his career nicely. Um, but he's had, gosh, how many years here do we know? Uh, at least 15. how many? 15. 15. I was going to say at least since we've been in the district. So, um, it's been more than that. I think. Yeah, I feel like. Well, he was, he was hired by Jane. Yep. Yeah. Um, and just has been, you know, just a great representative, wonderful to work with. Um, I know the teachers and staff really respect him. You know, when there's a problem, he handles it very uh, professionally and um, with compassion for the people involved. And uh, we are definitely going to miss Dr. O. Very sorry to see him go. I would second that. I think Mark's been a great employee. He has served us very well, and I'm excited for his uh, advancement and sorry that he'll be leaving us. Yeah, I would just like to echo that as well and uh, thank uh, Dr. Alt, Mark, for all of his years of ex uh, experience. You know, I think that some people don't get to see sometimes the work of assistant superintendents. Uh, some of it can be behind the scenes. Um, and I think it's really important for people to understand um, the countless number of employees that Dr. Alt mentored, um, the people that he was involved with in terms of helping develop their careers, um, whether they were classified employees or certified employees. And uh, I just want to wish him well as he becomes a new leader of the Three Rivers School District. We're really happy for him and sad to see him go, of course. We're still going to beat Taylor everything we <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, can I have a motion for item 
A through uh, A through A sorry yes A one through nine sorry um, including the addendum uh, to accept Dr. Alt's resignation and uh, that was the only addition correct yes we want to go A one through ten okay. plus the addendums okay A one through ten plus the addendum which is under number nine. Right? Yeah, yeah, we have addendum items under number six and number nine. Okay. Um, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call. Dr. Hooker? Aye. Mrs. Johnson? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mrs. Singh? Aye. Mrs. Eichels? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tri-Trans report? For my report this evening, I have under item A to approve the minutes of the May 19th regular meeting and the May 28th special meeting. Uh, item B is to approve the financial reports for the month ending May 31st, 2020. Uh, we have several contracts to approve. Typically, we pr approve these throughout the spring, uh, but with the, the unusual circumstances and the um, sort of the a non-traditional start of school next year uh, we've, we've waited and we've sort of refined some of these contracts um, and now we've got them on in June item one is for MEO business group that's our OT and PT that's for school year 2021 the occupational therapist $124,000 and the physical therapist $37,200 uh, an additional contract with the MEO business group for our preschool ther speech therapist uh, $12,400. Uh, the maximum health care services staffing rates cost is dictated by attachment A. Those uh, services are as needed. Item four is Aramark Educational Services, the food service management for school year 21. Um, this is actually the sixth year we'll have Aramark in under this contract, which is unusual because typically we would do that RFP in the fifth year. Uh, the United States Department of Agriculture allowed us to uh, continue with our, our food service for one more year based on the COVID-19 pandemic. Item five is the, is the Hamilton Claremont Cooperative for Technology Services, $54,242.40. Item six, the Hamilton County ESC on behalf of Rockhorn Academy. Those are for student services and intervention solutions. $75,794.40. And item seven is Hamilton County ESC on behalf of St. Vincent Fair, Student Services and Intervention Solutions, $149,492.20. Item six and seven are both items that are taken out of the, uh, the auxiliary services fund uh, that we maintain for both of those non-public school districts. Item D is to authorize the treasurer to supplement appropriations as needed and to make necessary appropriation budget modification, including any advances and transfers to close the financial books for 2020. A listing will be provided for the minutes when approved. Item E is to accept the proposal for commercial casualty insurance for Ohio school plan, $117,511. Insurance consultant was sent to each board member for their review along with the financials of Ohio School Plan. Item F is the approval to pay a now and then invoice for school dude, $3,348.21. Item G is to approve the 2021 temporary appropriations resolution. Uh, this is so we can pay the bills in July before we have the permanent appropriations in August. Item H is a resolution declaring the impracticability of transportation and offering payment to parents in lieu of transportation for school year 2020. I would like to make a comment on E. Um, this is another example of you going out and trying to wisely save the district money. You are always looking for a way to save us money, but can maintain quality of service, and I appreciate that very much. So thank you. Um, one thing, I, and I thank you, Dr. Hooker. One thing I'd like to point out about the Ohio School Plan, um, this is a pooled plan that's been in service for over 20 years. Um, it's now in 290 school districts statewide. 
So it's a very quality plan. Um, it serves a lot of districts very well, and I think it'll serve us very well in the future. Um, and we'll be we'll be uh, excited to give that broker a call tomorrow and let her know that uh, we can start the process of converting to that that service. And then on the um, impracticability of transportation, um, I'm assuming that this may change or grow based on what we need to do to get back to school for our own students, correct? For, well, for this year, this is this year's for 2020. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like for 2021. As part of that transportation, there has been discussion of um, not, not having bus services for non-public districts. Um, just because of the way transportation is going to look next year. Now, I don't know if that's going to come to fruition, um, but this could look different next year. Okay. Yeah, these are the payments for the people that were not bus this year. Correct. Oh, that's right. I was afraid we do that. Like, yeah, we always have to do this kind numbers. of backwards, yeah. it seems to me. But. We do it the last, the last business meeting we have, and then we pay them before the end of the fiscal year. Oh, okay. Yep. Sure. All right, I forgot that part. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, so um, could I have oops, could I have a motion to accept charges report A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H? Mm -hmm. A through H. Mm -hmm. So moved. A second. Third. Second. Roll call. Mrs. Johnston. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mrs. Singh. Aye. Dr. Hooker. Aye. Mrs. Eichel. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other business by the board and administration um, operations committee. The capital plan second reading. Uh, there was no changes from the first reading. Uh, if you remember, this was the scale down plan where we did uh, technology and transportation were the two uh, departments that we addressed this year with capital spend expenditures, and that's going to be what the second reading will be as well. Kicking the can down the road, but we have no choice. Okay, I make so a motion that we accept the capital plan second reading, or capital plan. Second. Rob Dr. Hooker? Aye. Mrs. Johnston? Aye. Mrs. Lewis? Aye. Mrs. Singh? Aye. Doc Mrs. Eichels? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Personnel committee, um, we just have the minutes attached to the agenda. Yeah, there's nothing to approve as a right. Book. It's just there yeah. for your information. Okay, and our last item, um, we need to have a discussion, obviously, about our bond and operating levy. You have the two resolutions that came back from the state from the county auditor regarding the actual millage based Ms. on Mrs. Eichels, those aren't resolutions, those are certifications. Oh, sorry. Wrong word, sorry. Certifications. From, we will pass a resolution to accept the certification or vote on the resolution for the certifications. But you have the certifications in your packet and they were emailed out prior. Um, so I just like to open for a bit of discussion um, before there's, if there's going to be a motion. So I, guess, um, I, I will. Um, you know, talk about kind of where we've been, right? So, yeah. um, obviously, before the March 12th meeting, um, we got a lot of presentations, and we did. Uh, there were so many people that did so much work, and we did a lot of studying as a board and made determinations of the need in our district for both an operating library and for the bond issuance. And you know, we looked at various alternatives and and passed a resolution on on March 12th uh, to move forward with the combined issuance. And less than a week after that, um, COVID-19 became a pandemic and life changed for everybody. And so we, um, we put on hold, although we continued to talk about it in our virtual board meetings. And um, so kind of, it, it's, it's a difficult decision because none of us know what COVID is going to look like. None of us know what November is going to look like. None of us know what May is going to look like. And, you know, we all made the decision, and it, does, it hasn't changed, that we have the need for the operating levy, and we have the need for the bond. And so from my perspective, 
despite the fact that it's difficult and none of us really know what the November election is going to look like and none of us know how COVID has impacted and will continue to impact our community, I think that we made a reasoned decision based on a lot of facts and a lot of information to move forward with the bond. And I think that our concern has been, you know, what what's it going to look like in educating the public? And, and so it's a condensed time period. None of us know if there's going to be, you know, we've opened up some now. Mm -hmm. uh, none of us know if it'll continue to open up or if it reverts back to closing up. But I don't know that we can continue to wait to see what's going to happen. Um, so I know I've been all over the place on this because uh, I personally have never had to look through a pandemic before. And um, you're not alone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think we've all learned to live differently and work differently at our respective jobs. And so I'm ready to vote tonight. Um, and uh, I don't think I wasn't ready to vote before because I was waiting, waiting for things to figure out, you know, how things were going to end. So that, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, that's fair enough. I, I want to say that I have been so proud that this board could discuss it we could disagree, we could say I'm concerned, I need more time. I am ecstatic about the process. You know, what are those two things, never see sausage or laws made? Maybe we gotta add school board on that, but I'm really proud of how things work, and it's great. I think you listen to me, I feel like, I hope you believe I've listened to you and Nikki. And so I'm very proud, and so I'm really, I, I hate that we waited an extra month but I'm glad we waited an extra month. You know what I mean? I think it was important that we we think about it and, and get our input and everything. So I, I'm very happy where we are, and I'm, I'm actually happy with the process that we went through. Elizabeth or Nikki? Oh, well, I, I have to agree with you, Eddie. I think that's one of um, the significant uh, aspects of our school board. We've always been willing to listen to each other and We've always been willing to look at all sides of the discussion, and there's, it's a difficult decision to make because, as Kim says, we don't know what COVID is going to look like. No. Hopefully, hopefully COVID is short term. Our needs are long term. What we're voting on affects the welfare and ed education of not only our students but our community. For the next 30 50 years so this has been a very difficult decision and um i think we need to give every community member the opportunity to weigh in on this i mean we've looked at this for three years we've done an amazing amount of research we've had a lot of uh, community members involved on the finance committee and the operations committee and they unanimously came to the same decision brought it forward to us for us to look at and consider. We've done our work as well, and um, I'm proud of all of you. So I put down my thoughts into, um, before I say that, I just want to say thank you to all the community members who reached out to us. Mm -hmm. And some had questions, some had concerns, and a lot of them had a lot of support. And I really appreciate each of each and every one of them, and their voices matter. And because of them, we are here. So the reason many of them asked me why did I take a pause? So I took a pause in May because the economic situation surrounding the COVID-19 was very uncertain, and we were not sure what reopening would look like at the local and the national level. And I have always supported the levy and bond, which will continue because I think the board has done a phenomenal job of doing intense research into it. We just did decide this yesterday that this need is there and we just put it on a ballot. I think the board has done a great job in find, getting parents involved. And we had these two amazing committees, uh, steering committee and finance committee, which really looked into, and I was part of the, so I can speak for it, that we really looked into every details. And 
put this meet together with the help of administrative team and the consultant in I think it was the whole process was like the last two or three years which shows there's a strong need for it and the concern that I had at the time in May have been elevated and I'm happy about it. So as things are changing since we met last and now we know that there are more data coming so we are very really well informed in comparison to May. There are a few facts that makes me feel better to go forward with this is the economy slowly recovering and as Ohio slowly like as Ohio slowly opening up and I can see the economy is coming back slowly. We are getting more and more data that in Ohio, COVID numbers has been stable. It has not gone uncontrolled. And my only hope is that we don't see a second surge. And even if we see a second surge, this time we'll be more prepared because it's not a surprise. And we know how to deal with it. So that's making me feel better. And now we're getting more treatment options based on the evidence-based studies. And several sources have indicated that hopefully the vaccine is on its way sometime soon. Uh, I think by November we will have COVID, but at least there is a better hope now. And then as per our RBC bond consultant, the municipal market condition seems very strong. And then the interest rates have gone historically low, which is amazing for us when we are looking for the bond. So just for uh, in February, we were looking at 3.75 versus which is now 2.40. Although this rate can fluctuate, but still if it remains this and if bond and levy passes, then there is a significant saving for our taxpayers, which is like 15.1 million, I believe, right? So which is a huge amount. So with all and all the budget cuts that we have seen from the states, which we know that are going to continue next year too. Looking at all this, I feel it is now more important that we put this levy on the ballot in November so that we don't have to make uh, any cuts that would impact our community. So that's how now I feel much better and confident that yes, we should put it in November and let people give choice to vote on it. Um, great, and uh, thank you everyone for your input. And I, I, can, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference than I, what I can say other than, um, you know, a big thank you to the community committees, big thank you to the administration, big thank you to the board, uh, the community who have comments, um, you know, and no matter whether they're for or against or unsure, having those comments makes us, us think through mm -hmm. everything and, um, recognizing that everybody has different opinions and I think that that's really important going forward and I think you know it isn't necessarily the job of really isn't at all the job of the board to determine how and when to win this mm -hmm. levy right. um, it's more to be sure that what we put out there is accurate well thought out and in line with the needs of the district and I think now's the time mm -hmm. um, if we wait any longer then we're going to really start getting into trouble and uh, it is time for the community to weigh in and I am ready to move forward. Can I ask a question? I'd like to go ahead and make a motion but sure. I'm not sure how the motion needs to be worded. Can I have <laughs> Before Elsa? we have a motion I've got one public commentary as well so okay. Um, okay. Before you get yeah. the public comment I'd just like to add additionally to Kim's point about where we were and where we are um, and we've shared resources with the board. You all recall that we shared a lot of resources from the consultants back in February and March. And part of that, which I think is really important that, that Kim mentioned, is a community engagement phase moving forward as well, where we will continue to yes. seek input and feedback along the way as we look ahead, if that's what the board chooses to do. And we do have those amended plans and those are things that we can communicate about that I think the board can feel confident that we've adjusted that work if it's necessary and if we need to use it, we're ready with it. Great. Um, and we do have a, a statement from one of the committee members. Correct. Um, as part of this meeting, it was noticed out that uh, public commentary could be sent to the treasurer 
Um, I did receive one email. Um, that was from Bear Tullis, and I'll read it as written. Steph Cushman, Craig Summerall, and I wanted to send along a message of support for tonight's bond levy vote. We would be there in person if permitted, but understand that it is not possible due to COVID-19 safety procedures. Please forward this message to the school board at tonight's meeting. Each of us strongly support moving forward with the bond levy issuance now. Our primary reasons are summarized below. The funding need has not gone away. In fact, we believe the coronavirus pandemic has made it more real now. We are facing state budget cuts and the possibility of additional expenditures to accommodate for COVID-19 protocols, such as safety measures and investment in online learning, etc. Bond interest rates are at historical lows. This may be the best time to borrow money ever. Moving forward now will minimize the investment spent on short-term fixes to buildings. The continued need to apply band-aids to our facilities causes significant stress to the operational budget. With the general economic slowdown, we, will be, we believe we will be poised to take advantage of low cost and high avail availability of construction teams and materials. We believe moving forward now will embrace the current sense of community and goodwill towards Indian Hills School District. We believe moving forward now will capitalize on higher voter turnout in November. Programs and curriculum will be at risk sooner by not having the bond levy issuance on the ballot this November. Every year this goes on, we have more risk of defections to private schools. Security needs for some of the campuses need to be funded sooner than later. We may also have a unique opportunity to address biological pathological issues. We acknowledge this is an unprecedented time and issues relating to the coronavirus pandemic change almost daily. However, we do not believe delaying the vote until next spring or later increases the chances the levy passes. I am confident that this will pass this fall, ensuring the school district receives the necessary funds to maintain its status as one of the best school districts in Ohio. We appreciate all the work and time the school board and the various committees have put into this project to date. This has been a true community-wide effort. We look forward to continuing that community effort as we seek support for the vote's passage. Thank you for your consideration, Steph, Craig, and Bear. Thank you, Steph, Craig, and Bear. That was very helpful, and, and I know that you've already put in a ton of time, and I'm expecting that you're probably going to put in a lot more time. Um, and, you know, I think we all know there's, no, there's never a good time to raise taxes. Nobody wants to do that, but sometimes, um, you know, it's necessary, and we've laid it as long as we can. So, did you want to make? Yeah, I want to make a motion, but I want to make sure it's scored correctly. Can you so, help me with this? So, Dr. Hooker, if you take that document that was in front of you. Yep. Um, you'll see halfway down the middle of the page there, there's a, a, a box paragraph that's in bold. Yep. It starts with the resolution. I think if you read that, that that will uh, be the resolution that we need to pass. I make a motion that we pass a resolution determining to proceed with submitting to the electors of the school district the single question of the issuance of school facilities improvement bonds in the aggregate principal amount of $77 million and the levying of an additional 2.46 mil tax to provide funds for current operating expenses pursuant to section 5705.218 of the revised code. And then below that language, there's some additional language there that's part of the resolution. Um, that will go out in when we put the minutes to the on the. As part of my motion, I, I ask that all this be attached. To Correct. It. And do we have a second? I second. Roll call. Dr. Hooker. Aye. Mrs. Singh. Aye. Mrs. Johnston. Aye. Mrs. Lewis. Aye. Mrs. Eicholtz. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone Thank you. and the board in particular. I, I remember the long nights and all the reading and uh, and to uh, Melissa, Nick, Kirk, the, the time that you all put in and everybody else on the staff that participated is, uh, I'm just praying that it all pays off <laughs> and, um, and that you can all have a proud ending to this. 
we look forward to uh, communicating out some next steps to the community soon for uh, the next phase of community engagement to talk about pre-bond planning. And uh, that will give our community also a chance for input directly with us and more recommendations in the future. And we'll be sharing that information out soon. And I do want uh, those that are actually watching us, and they need to understand that the board cannot advocate for passage of this bond or levy. Mm -hmm. We can answer a question if they want to contact us, but we are not allowed by law to, uh, to go and try to advocate for it. So am I correct on that's the right wording? Okay. We're, not, we're not here to change anybody's minds. Yeah, so we will be delighted to provide education on what it means, but you, you can talk to the committees that will be formed that can advocate all they want, but we cannot do that. So it's not that we're not trying to advocate for something we believe in, it's that we can't by law do so. Okay, um, is there any other business? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.